Hello, Laypoint family. Happy Mother's Day. I am so happy to be here. I am so grateful to be here under the leadership of the spiritual fathers of this house to encourage the women of Laypoint. Especially on this day that we get to celebrate all the birth moms, spiritual moms, and mom figures in our lives across all of our campuses, in person and online. And of course, our Mama Latina también. ¿Alguna Mama Latina in the room? Yes! I asked that question last night and nobody answered, so I guess Latinos come to church on Sunday, so that's, that's, that's a good thing to know. <laughs> and well, let's dive right in uh, to what we will be talking about today. I was thinking about and praying, what could I talk about on Mother's Day? And the Lord, like months ago, literally last year, brought this subject to my heart. And, in, and I think it's one of the most popular um, subjects around motherhood issues these days and is the famous mom guilt which basically is the feeling that every mom in the world has on a daily basis about whether or not she's doing a good job as a mom. We tend to second guess every decision we make. We tend to think that every little mistake is going to scar our kids for life and they're going to be traumatized and need therapy for the rest of their lives. Everybody else is a better mom than us. And basically, mom guilt is the feeling that no matter what we do, we're never going to be a good enough mom. And I know it sounds terrible because it is, but I think it's very similar to what any committed Christian may feel at least every once in a while. Because we have a genuine desire to please the Lord, to obey Him, to live a life that brings honor and glory to the Lord. But we always seem to fall short on that. And that's where guilt comes in. I love how Paul uh, describes it in Romans 7:19. It says, "For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing." And I think we have all been there. We all suffer that constant battle and struggle, uh, you know, between wanting to do the, you know, what God had, wants us to do, but also dealing and battling against our sinful nature. At some point in these verses, Paul says, what a wretched man I am. We can see this battle, his guilt of not being able to always do what is right. But the thing about guilt is that guilt by itself is neither good or bad. Hear me out. Guilt by itself is just a feeling. Guilt by definition is feeling responsible or regretful for a perceived offense, real or imaginary. And don't lose sight of this definition because we'll discuss it in detail in this message. And as any other feeling, guilt by itself is not the problem. Like feeling angry or sad or scared or worried is not the problem. The problem is what we do with that feeling. How do we react to that feeling? How much power do we give to that feeling over our lives? A few weeks ago, Pastor Josh talked about the lives of Peter and Judas. Both of them were disciples of Jesus. Both of them sat under Jesus' teachings. Both of them heard the gospel from the mouth of Jesus. Both of them were warned about the specific sin they would commit. Both of them betrayed Jesus on the same night. One of them denied him three times and the other one sold him to his enemies. And listen, both of them felt guilty about it. But both of them took different paths. One of them ended his life because of his guilt, but the other one ran to Jesus and was redeemed. Guilt by itself is just a feeling and can be neither good or bad. But it is what we decide to do with that guilt what can lead us to a path of condemnation and dead or redemption and life. And of course, there's a lot of spiritual background on all of this, and we'll also see that. But first, I wanted to talk about how to handle that guilt. How can we manage it? What, what can we do about it? Because another fact about guilt is that it is inevitable. It doesn't matter if you're the perfect mom, which you're not, or if you're the perfect Christian, which you're not. We all gonna feel guilt at some point in our lives. And if you don't feel guilt, that's another message for you. I'm gonna leave Pastor Josh to talk to you about that. <laughs> but uh, I'm very visual, like I need to have things explained to me like with pears and apples so I can understand. So I did a mental map. I don't know if you call it that way, but in Spanish it was mapa mental, so I just translated it, so just go with it. Um, so we can just understand how to process our guilt, okay? So, guilt. 
enters in our minds, in our hearts, guilt comes in, comes in. And this can be in many different ways. There's always a trigger for guilt. Maybe something reminds you of something you did in the past that is still causing consequences or you actually just did something and you just realized that it was wrong. I mean, guilt can come to us in many different ways. So what do we do with that feeling? The first thing, I have a hair in my hand. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, the first thing is that you have to ask yourself the question, is it legit? And what I mean by that is, is it actually a sin that we committed? Is it something that we did that hurt someone? Is it something in our lives that goes against the word of God? Is it something that God told us to do and we didn't? Is it something that we haven't asked for God's forgiveness yet? And the reason I say this as the first step is because a lot of times we just feel guilty about things that are actually not even a sin. Like moms, we feel guilty because we just gave cereal to our kids for breakfast and then we saw a mom making pancakes with strawberries around it like a sun and put blueberries like eyes and a little, you know, butterfly in there and we're like, oh, I'm traumatizing my kids. Or maybe we just did a birthday party that wasn't Pinterest material. It was just all Amazon material because you just ordered it online. <laughs> or you feel guilty because you just sent a gift card to the teacher on Teacher's Appreciation Week. And then you saw the other moms sent like beautiful baskets with thoughtful gifts. And you just like, I'm just projecting myself. But it's just like, the, we feel guilty about this stuff. It's not even a sin. Or like a believer, you may feel guilty because you're only able to serve once a month instead of every week. Or because you're too shy and the other time your live group leader just asked you to teach the class and you didn't dare, so you just brought snacks and you feel guilty. Or because you had a difficult week and your time with the Lord wasn't what you expected it to be. Like the definition of guilt says, we can feel guilty for something real or imaginary. And believe me, the enemy loves to just make you feel guilty about anything, even imaginary things. So we have to ask ourselves, is the reason of my guilt a real sin? Is there a legitimate reason to feel guilt about this? And this is not a decision that you should make by yourself. We really have to bring that guilt to the Lord and ask him, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We need to come to God to bring our guilt to God and ask him to reveal to us if there's a sinful intention, a sinful thought, if there's anything genuine in that thought of guilt. And if we really do this, we're going to realize that sometimes that guilt is imaginary. So if the answer is no, it's not legit, we're not going to leave it there because if not, it's going to keep coming back. We need to analyze why, why are we feeling guilty about this? We need to ask ourselves, what is the reason? And there can be many reasons, but we're only going only gonna to talk about three today that I think is the main ones. Comparison, insecurity, and unrealistic expectations. So we're going to start with the first one. Comparison, and this is the worst of them all because we are constantly, consciously or unconsciously comparing ourselves to other people. Oh, that person has a nicer house than ours. That person has a gift that I don't have. That mom cooks homemade organic foods all the time and I just give frozen foods to my kids. Or that mom eats everything she wants and doesn't gain weight. How unfair is that? We feel guilty because we do. By the way, if you eat everything you want and don't gain weight, please leave the room. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We love you because we have to. God tells us to. But anyway. <laughs> but the point is we compare ourselves to other people all the time. And I'm not going to even go into social media. I have a love-hate relationship with social media. I know it's good for some things, but like... Everybody posting their perfect lives, their perfect food place with a perfect filter, and everybody fighting about it in the comments. Like, oh, it's so exhausting. But the point is comparison causes guilt. Comparison is completely diabolical. Don't minimize it because it makes us look to other people instead of looking to God. Don't look sideways. Look up. So today, thank you for that. Commit to it, okay? 
So today, I'm going to give you what I believe to be, in my personal opinion, the best verse in the Bible about comparison, and it's in the words of Jesus himself. But first, let me give you a little context. Remember Peter, the one that betrayed Jesus? We mentioned it uh, a little bit ago. Uh, The night of Jesus' crucifixion, he denied knowing him three times out of fear of being killed like Jesus. And I know we all betray Jesus when we sin, but he betrayed him like to his face. I know it's the same, but it kind of feels worse to me. So Jesus, after he resurrects, he appears to his disciples a few times here and there. And in one of those times, he has a special moment with Peter. When he asks Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. And then a second time, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you, says Peter. And then a third time, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. And then Jesus starts affirming Peter on his faith. And he has his, this moment with Peter where Jesus restores the relationship and redeems Peter's failure. It's not a coincidence that Peter denied him three times and then Jesus makes him say, I love you three times. And then he even reveals to him that he was going to give his life for Jesus, that his faith was going to be so strong that he was going to end up giving his life for him. And then he reveals all the mighty things that he was going to do through him. And it was a very beautiful moment between Jesus and Peter. And then in the middle of that moment, it wasn't even over when we find this verse in John 21, verse 20. It says, they were talking... And then Peter turned around sideways and saw behind them the disciple Jesus loved, the one who had leaned over to Jesus during supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? He was talking about John that is known in the Bible as the beloved disciple. And then Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? I mean, just imagine Jesus' frustration in this moment. He was doing something very special with Peter, revealing to him his calling and how he was going to give his life for him and how Jesus was going to use him for mighty ways. And then Peter's response was, and what about him? Like, I just want to get into the Bible and slap Peter in the face. Just get it together, man. And before you say, oh, Peter, so sinful, so bad, we do the same. God is blessing us. He's calling us. He's working in us. He's perfecting us. He's doing amazing things in our lives, fulfilling our dreams. And we go, and what about the other person? Like, come on. So here comes the best verse that I told you about, that in my opinion is the best verse in the Bible about comparison. Are you ready for that? This is Jesus' response to Peter in verse 22. He said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you, follow me, period, no more. What's that to you? Whatever I do with the other person, whatever I give to the other person, what's that to you? I like it better in Spanish. It says, a ti que. It sounds more like punch you in the face or more polite. But like, a ti que, what's that to you? I mean, what do you care? It's none of your business. And I'm sorry, I'm not being harsh. This is Jesus' words. So the next time you catch yourself comparing yourself to other people and what do the other person, person has, just tell to yourself, what's that to me? It's none of my business. Stop looking to other people. Look up to me, says the Lord, and follow me. That's it. Amen? Amen. Are we getting it? <laughs> the second reason we may feel uh, unreal guilt is insecurity. And this is another illegitimate reason why we feel guilty. And it's because of our own insecurities and fears. We constantly feel we're not enough. We constantly feel we're not doing it right. We constantly feel we're not capable. We constantly feel we're not in control. We constantly feel we're not good. And here goes the motivational quote of the week. You're not. (laughs) But listen, Jesus is. You're not good enough. Jesus is. You're not capable. Jesus is. You're not doing it right. Jesus is. You're not in control of anything. But Jesus is in control of everything. You're not good at all. But Jesus is. All you have to do is to cling on to Jesus. And he will fill in all of those areas where you fall short. Listen. 
He will be your strength in all of your weaknesses. He called you and he will equip you and he will be with you every step of your motherhood and every step of your walk with Jesus. Like 2 Corinthians 3, 5 says, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency comes from God. Insecurity comes from the pressure we put on ourselves thinking that it is up to us to do a good job, to fulfill our calling, to perform well, to be a good mom, to be a good, a good, a good Christian. But let me burst your bubble. You can't. You're not sufficient on yourself to do that, any of that. Our sufficiency comes from God. And when we realize this, we can find rest. Amen? The third reason unrealistic expectations. And when my husband and I, we first moved here to the United States, we noticed something right away. I don't know if you have realized this, but you people apologize too much. Have you noticed that? Like you're at church trying to get a seat. Oh, I'm sorry. Is this your seat? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Please sit. Oh, no, I'm sorry. You go for it. I come on, it's just a seat. Like, <laughs> You apologize too much. And the funny thing is that I have started to do that, you know, myself, because I don't want to be the girl that somebody says, I'm sorry. And I'm like, well, I'm not. You know, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry too. <laughs> you know, I guess guilt is um, contagious. <laughs> and I know it's a joke, but we kind of do that. We set such high expectations of ourselves or of others that honestly sometimes are unrealistic and unnecessary. We have allowed society, appearances, other people, ideals, social media to dictate the expectations of how our motherhood or our lives as Christians should look like. And again, nothing and no one can set the standard except God. So expectations is another illegitimate reason to feel guilty. Now, we have learned all the imaginary side of guilt, but we also have to talk about when the guilt is actually real. Meaning when we go to the Lord and he examines us and he reveals to us hidden sin, bad intentions, dishonoring thoughts or motivations. Or sometimes you don't even have to go to the Lord. You just know right away that you messed up. So when the guilt is real, when the answer is yes, it is legit. First, we have to ask ourselves, has it been redeemed? And what I mean by, the, by this is sometimes guilt comes to us because of things that happened years ago or months ago or days ago. And we still go on and on and on in our heads what we, we should have done, what we shouldn't have done. And honestly, God has already forgiven you for that. So if the answer is yes, it has been redeemed, in this instance, the guilt is completely evil. It comes straight from Satan who keeps reminding us of what we did over and over again. And sometimes we're so used to live with that guilt that we don't even notice it anymore. But we shouldn't take this lightly because this comes straight from Satan. Let's read what, uh, what Revelation says about this in chapter 12. It says, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night by the, uh, before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. I don't know if we're getting this. The enemy knows that his time is short. And during this time, he's going to do anything in his power to destroy us. And the Bible says that he comes to us with great wrath. That guilt is the wrath of the enemy in our lives. But listen to this. 
These verses also tell us that he has already been conquered by the blood of the Lamb. And if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then it is your testimony that you have been saved by grace and you have been forgiven by the blood that Jesus shed for you at the cross. But when you stay in that guilt and we keep relieving what we have done, everything that God has already forgiven us for, we keep bringing up something that God has already thrown down. And listen, don't resurrect something that God has already defeated. And even worse, when we allow guilt to keep threatening us, like little by little, our sin becomes our identity. It gets to a point when we no longer did something. Now we are something. All of a sudden, we didn't just yell at our kids. We are a terrible mom. We didn't just commit adultery. We are now adulterers. You know what I mean? If you linger in guilt, what you've done becomes who you are. If you linger in guilt, what you've done becomes who you are. Some of you keep grieving something that happened way in the past. And listen to me. The enemy keeps attacking you with the same thing or with that thing that you can no longer make amends for, or that thing that still causes consequences to this day. And yes, what you did was terrible. I know it's painful because it's still there. But listen, if your sin, if your failure, if your mistakes are already covered by the blood of Christ, don't let guilt keep coming back, accusing you of something that God has already forgiven you for. Now, I was hoping for a clap right there, but anyway, okay, thank you, thank you. Now, what about if it's something that you just did or something that just has been re revealed to you or simply something that you haven't even processed with God? Meaning the answer is no, it hasn't been redeemed yet. Well, here it's actually the only instance where guilt is helpful, when we receive that revelation of something that we need to fix in our lives, that there's something we need to change, when we realize we are in sin, because then it is actually a conviction of sin, and that can only be brought by the Holy Spirit. Then it stops just being a feeling of guilt. Now it's a revelation of the Holy Spirit that we are in sin, and there's a difference. And yes, the conviction of sin from the Holy Spirit still causes guilt. But that conviction is something holy because it leads us to repentance and grace. So in this case, there's some steps we need to take. The first one is we need to confess. This is the first step towards deliverance. Sometimes you're going to deal with your guilt in private, but you need to confess it. The Bible talks about confessing our sins because he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It also talks about confessing our sins to one another and pray for one another so that we can be healed. We cannot move past guilt without confession. To God, to the people we have offended, and to other people so we can get help. Confession is the first step towards freedom. And you will never, hear me out, you will never be freed of the guilt if you don't confess what you've done. I love how, thank you for that. I love how David describes it in Psalms 32. It says, for when I kept silent of my sin, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand, I mean the, the Holy Spirit, the conviction from the Holy Spirit was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. I apologize in advance for the comparison I'm going to make, but it's like when you eat something that just, it was just bad, and you feel in your stomach like, you know, that not, you feel nauseated and bloated and like groaning uh, all day, and there gets to a point that you know that the only way you're going to feel better is for it to come out somehow. I don't know. I'm sorry. But that's the same thing with our sin. 
We have it there, groaning all day, nauseated, and we just need to confess it, to name it for what it is, to bring it to light so it can stop tormenting us. Because we, while we keep it hidden, it will keep bothering us. While it stays in the dark, it will continue having power up over us. You cannot avoid confession. This is a necessary step. The second one is repentance, to repent. And I put it second because first we need to acknowledge our sin and then we need to repent. And there's a difference between feeling bad and true repentance. Repentance comes from the Greek word metanoia. I don't know how to pronounce that. I know Spanish and English, Greek. Come on, it's too much for me. But metanoia means a change of mind, a reorientation, a fundamental transformation of outlook, of a man's vision of the world and of himself. So basically, it's not just feeling bad for what you did or feeling remorse. It's not just feelings. True repentance requires an action from your part. If not, it's just not repentance. It's just remorse. So we need to change. We need to take action. So for example, you yell too much. You have issues with anger. You have issues with an addiction, with something you're watching that you shouldn't be watching. What will you do about it? What boundaries are you going to put in place? What protective measures are you going to take to avoid falling into that again? Are you going to start an accountability system? How will you remove the temptation so you cannot even ex be exposed to that temptation? True repentance demands transformation. Like Romans 12 says, we need to leave the patterns of this world, be transformed by the renewal of our mind, and follow God's will. That is true repentance. And sometimes the reason we feel guilty for such a long time is because we just stay in that feeling bad stage, and we never take the next step of actually doing something about it. That's true repentance. And the third step is to make amends. It's obviously related to confession and true repentance. But if we did something that was wrong or hurt someone, or if there is something in our lives that we need to change or do better, or if there is something that we can do to restore a relationship that was broken because of our own actions, then we need to do it. We need to own up to our mistakes. And if there's a possibility of fix what we did, do it. If it's in your hands to make peace with those you have wronged, try it. Like Romans 12, 18 says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And I love it because it says, if possible, as it depends on you. Like it's basically saying, you do your best, you try hard, but if nothing happens, you're off the hook. You cannot keep allowing guilt to just attack you for something that you have no control over if the other person doesn't want to be reconciled. So we, we have peace in that. So we have all our mental map. When all is said and done, when we have taken our guilt to the Lord, when we have processed it under the light of his word, when we have discarded imaginary guilt, when we have done what we have to do with the real guilt, when we have repented, confessed, and made amends, when it is all under the blood of Jesus, then send that guilt back to hell. Amen? In the name of Jesus. And I'm not cussing. I'm saying this because that's where it belongs. Because that guilt then is only a tool from the devil and it belongs in hell with him. And besides, it's the one time that a Christian can tell something to go to hell and not be rude. So take your chance with this. This is your chance. Now there's one last thing I need to say about guilt and, and we'll finish with this. There is guilt, the feeling, okay? But there's also the voice of the Holy Spirit and the voice of Satan. Both of them will speak into our guilt. Both of them will try to pull us in their direction. Both of them will use guilt for their purposes. One leads to conviction. The other one leads to condemnation. One takes us to life and the other one brings death. Like 2 Corinthians 7, 10 says, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. 
The Holy Spirit will lead you to salvation without regret, but the devil will lead you to death. And my question for you today is, which voice will you hear in your guilt? Maybe you're sitting here and you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't even have a relationship with God. I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to read my Bible. I'm new here. I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, even if you're even, you haven't even come to Christ, the Holy Spirit is talking to you too. The devil is talking to you too. That discomfort, that feeling you, you have, like there's got to be something more. There's got to be something else. This doesn't feel right. That's the Holy Spirit that is saying to you, hey, that's not for you. I don't, I, I don't want that for you. Come to me. I have something better for you. But that voice you hear, you're such a drunk. You're good for nothing. You're never going to change. You're just like your mother and you're going to make the same mistakes she made. Your kids, you're going to ruin your kids. That voice... It's the devil's. So which voice would you hear in your guilt? Will you let the Holy Spirit lead you to salvation without regret how peaceful that it sounds? Are you gonna allow the devil to lead you straight to your death, to live a condemned life forever? Let me pray for you, God. Thank you because you are so gracious, you're so good to us. And because in the middle of our guilt, in the middle of our mistakes, in the middle of our failure, you, you speak to us and you speak life to us and you call us and you, you want to bring us into your salvation. God, allow us to hear your voice in the middle of our guilt. That every mom here in the room, whenever she feels guilty, that she can run to you and bring that guilt to you so you can reveal to her if it's even real or not so she can find peace and rest in you. Not in her own understanding, but in your truth. And God, every person here that is just holding on to that mistake, to that failure, that is such a burden in their hearts, Father, let them be free today. Let them find the freedom and the grace and the forgiveness that is available for them. Thank you for this day, in Jesus' name, amen.